And so yeah, this is what we came for, right? Let's figure out how to effectively witness to the Jehovah's Witnesses and reach them for the Lord. So I'm glad to see everybody out bright and early this morning. I say when I told Sean it was like Saturday the time on Saturday doesn't matter and everything, I was thinking he might say about two o'clock, <laughs> three o'clock. Now let's do ten in the morning. And I'm like, okay, you're gonna cut into my sleep time, but all right. So, but it is fine. I'm I'm a morning person usually anyway, so I'm usually up and rolling. So I'm glad to see everybody was able to make it out here this morning. So again, just a little bit of a recap of some of the things that we've discussed over the past couple of nights, just up before we get kind of moving into what we're going to be going through today. So again, Thursday night we looked at, you know, false religions and cults, kind of trying to understand them a little bit better, understand how people can end up in a cult and the way the cults end up working and how they attract people in. Remember, they're usually going after people who have vulnerabilities that they have uh, things that can be exploited in their life that will be actually be able to be used and manipulate people in order to come into or have them to join the cult. And the cults, again, are usually trying to pretend like they're mainstream, but they have like really, really bad, you know, way off doctrines and stuff about ideas. And then their thing and usually have a very charismatic leader, but also exercises authoritarian powers which means that they're, you do what they say or else, pretty much, attitude. Then we looked at the history of the Jehovah's Witnesses, saw how that they were created and founded by Charles Russell and then expanded under Judge Rutherford as well as Knorr and several others. And so we saw how that, some of the foundations of the Jehovah's Witnesses came to be. Last night we t took some time to understand their beliefs, to look and see what exactly they teach, what they, or the doctrines they have, and what that way we can understand how to effectively witness to them, understand what their uh, objections will end up being to us as we try to witness to them. And when they say something, we won't be surprised about it because we kind of know some of their core doctrines and main teachings. So tonight, we are going to... Again, or not tonight, but today. This, this is the morning, night of the night. So, but again, uh, we're going to be looking at effectively witnessing to them. This is going to be two parts. So, again, we'll have two sessions. We'll have the break in between like we had before. And then when we get done with uh, session two, we'll have the question and answer session. And we'll, we'll draw out the questions out of the box. So, again, if you have any other questions and stuff or any, about anything, again, anything Bible related, or whatever, if you want to throw a history question out there too, I might be able to answer that, I don't know, I'm just a history teacher, I don't know if I'd be able to answer a history question, but anyway, so, but again, if you have any questions about anything that, you know, feel free to just write, jot it down, again, stick it in the box, whatnot, we'll be randomly pulling questions out of that, and I'll answer as many as I can in the 30 minute session, um, if I don't get to all of them, I will end up probably using some of those questions on the website and stuff on uh, BooHillBibleMinistries.org, our website. I actually have an area for I Want to Know. That's kind of the name of the question session that, section that I have there. And so it, some of those questions may end up on the website. Again, it's completely anonymous. You do not have to put your name on there. I actually discourage you putting your name on there just because it's makes people more open to wanting to ask things if they can feel like that they have some anonymity behind it. So let's go ahead and get to it. So let's get to the witnessing, see how we can witness to Joe's witnesses. So there's some things we need to understand before we actually start witnessing to them. So waiting for the slide to change there. There we go. We, we got a new person. We got a new person up there. So, all right. So again, things to understand before witnessing. There are some things we have to make sure we really know and we can really understand about the Jehovah's Witnesses before we can actually go out and get ready to start dealing with them. So we have to make sure that we understand these key concepts here and how they're thinking about things. So first off, the Jehovah's Witnesses are thoroughly trained in how to respond to those who oppose their message. 
They are very well-trained people, guys. They're not pushovers. They have been thoroughly indoctrinated in their beliefs through years of training. They don't, the people that are going door to door most of the time are not newbies. They've been there for a few years at the least. Now, usually you have two witnesses come to your door. You have one who has a lot of experience, probably been a witness for 20 years or better, and has been doing the door knocking quite a bit. The other one is usually newer to the door knocking and stuff and is kind of in training and whatnot. So that's something to realize, but do note that they are very well trained, especially the leader or the main person, you know, doing the talking and stuff. So they are very well trained in how to respond to people. They are taught that everything you believe about the Bible is of pagan origin. They're the ones that has the truth. We, what you're teaching is nothing but paganism. It has pagan influence. It's not correct. It's not coming from God. If you try to argue with them over scripture, then they will shut down and quickly leave. If you try to start arguing scripture with them and try to say, that's not what it says or means, this is what it actually means, they'll shut down and they'll just go away. And some people are like, yes, I won. That's, that's not a victory, guys. Because guess what? They're walking out and they're still going to hell. That's not a victory. That's a, that's a sad disappointment. So, again, we got to watch how we, again, communicate with them. So, we are also taught how to be in, or sorry, we, not, they are also taught how to be in control of the conversation. They are taught to dictate and control the entire conversation to make sure that what they're wanting to say and the message that they're getting through is conveyed to the person they're trying to witness to. The way they do this, they'll generally ask a question from the Watchtower magazine, and then they'll have the person read the answer from the Watchtower magazine. So they'll ask a question, and they'll say, Something, and then they'll have you, as I look, what does it say here the answer is? And they'll have you read the answer. So the reason why I do that, oh, sorry, only after you've uh, been influenced by their position, again, reading what they say about it after several times, only then will they actually go to the Bible. They will use the New World Translation, the Bible, a little bit to try to prove their point. But what do they do first? They sit there and they're putting their ideas in your head first. And then go into Scripture and say, see, we have the backup here in the Bible. And that's not the way it should work, right? The Scripture should always come first whenever you're trying to teach somebody anything about the Bible. But again, it's a manipulation tactic. Again, they do this to try to brainwash people into seeing their interpretation of Scripture as correct. And also by giving their views and then backing it up with a distorted interpretation of Scripture, like I said, they can quickly trick people into seeing that they are correct about things. Again, this is a manipulation tactic. And if you don't understand how they do this and whatnot, then again, and there's a lot of people that are duped by this pretty easily. So, you know, we got to make sure that we, you know, understand how they work. So, again, they are taught to control all these things. And we need to remember that they believe that they honestly have the truth and they're, to he- they're there to help you. They honestly believe they're there to help you know what the truth is. And you're not there to teach them, they're there to teach you. That's what their idea is, that's their mindset. All right. Now, interestingly enough, many of the people who are Jehovah's Witnesses are former Catholics, Protestants, or from some other denomination of Christianity. I, mean, I can't remember the statistics, but I know about maybe 50% at least or may be former Catholic. Another 20% come from Protestant churches and other denominations. So, again, they already know what you believe most of the time. They already know what the mainstream Christianity is preaching and teaching. You don't have to fully try to convince them of that. They already know these things. And they're taught that these things are, again, of pagan origin, that they are not true scripture. 
So when we witness to Jehovah's Witnesses, it is important to remember that the individual Jehovah's Witness is not your enemy. The organization is the enemy. The individual that is a member of that is not the enemy. We're not there to attack them. We're not there to sit there and show that we're right, you're wrong. We're there to help them. Again, the Jehovah's Witnesses have submitted themselves to the authority of the Watchtower Society. They, they have put that organization above everything else. That is their ultimate authority. That is what they believe in. Again, they believe that your faith needs to come under the control of the Watchtower Society and its authority as well. So they're going to try to convince you that you need to obey the Watchtower Society also. That, again, is their goal. They must first come to a place of rejecting the authority and message of the Watchtower Society, guys. To effectively witness to the Jehovah's Witnesses, you've got to break that trust they have in that organization. If you don't break that trust, you're not going to get anywhere. Why? Because they are trusting that as their way of salvation. And they're trusting that organization has the truth. Your challenge, whenever you're witnessing to Jehovah's Witnesses and trying to reach them, is to destroy their confidence in the organization and its publications. You have to destroy and tear down their confidence in the Watchtower Society and the Watchtower Magazine and all their books and all that thing. That is your goal. And that is the number one goal. Your strategy is not to confront them with the Bible. Wait a minute, I thought we were trying to get them saved. We are, but if you start off with the scripture, you start off with the Bible, you're going to hit a brick road, or a brick wall, I mean, and you're going to go nowhere. You cannot argue Bible with them. Do not argue scripture with them. That is very important. Because, again, they are trained to know how to counteract your arguments. They are going to sit there and say, Oh, no, that's not true, that's not right, etc., etc. Whether you bring up them going to heaven if they get saved or going to hell if they don't get saved or whatever it is, you're going to hit a brick wall. And you're definitely going to need to, again, stay away from arguing Bible with them. And if you start arguing with them, you're going to get nowhere. Again, you want to control the conversation. You want to take the control of the conversation out of their hands and put it in your hands. All right, that is going to be the key. So you are to confront the source that feeds them what they believe is to be God's message. So again, you're not arguing scripture with them. You're, arguing, you're going to confront their authority. They've got to understand that what they believe is their final authority is fallible. It's not right. And they need to figure out that they need to put their trust as the Bible as its final authority. And again, in order to do that, we got to go against their publications. we got to sit there and attack that as we get ready to witness. Now, we're going to do that in a mean and nasty way and sit there and go, this is just stupid, you shouldn't sit there and follow that. I can't believe you're dumb enough to actually think this. Should we do all that when we're trying to witness to somebody? No, right? That is a very off-putting way. We need to make sure we keep our emotions in check over things and, again, make sure that we are displaying the love of Christ with care and compassion as we talk to anybody about the Lord. That is the only way that we will effectively reach them for Jesus. So again, we also need to remember to speak with compassion and care, as I just said a while ago. And that is a very important thing for us to make sure we know. Do note, you're not there, you're not in a debate trying to win an argument. You're not in a formal debate trying to win an argument. You're not there trying to prove that you're right and they're wrong. Uh, you're not there trying to prove that you're right and they're wrong. Too many people, that's what they want to do with anything when they're confronted with somebody who believes opposite of them. Well, I want to sit there and show you that I'm right. But a lot of times, what does that do? If you start, if both sides are sitting there just trying to prove they're right, what you're sinking in, you're grounding into your position and you're refusing to listen to the other side. Instead, you want to try to get them to think about some things a little bit. 
You say, remember, the Jehovah's Witnesses discourage individual thinking, right? They discourage you to think for yourself. So what? We got to try to encourage them to think a little bit. Use the common sense God gave them. And use logic and reasoning. Again you're, again, you're not trying to show that you're superior to them. You're trying to guide a poor lost soul to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. You're trying to bring somebody to the Lord the, and to a correct understanding of the Lord. So we need to be courageous, direct, and insistent. Yes. But we also need to be kind, understanding, and thoughtful. And we need to be patient as well. Oh, man, Kevin, that's a dirty word, patience. Most tribulation brings forth patience, Kevin. You mean we have to be patient? Well, yeah. if you're going to sit there and deal with people, and especially people who are grounded in either a false religion or a cult who have been a part of these for several, several years, and you're wanting to try to shatter their entire worldview, it's going to take some patience and persistence. So... If, again, you've got to be willing to do the work if you want to effectively reach some of these people. Again, as we said a while ago, you're trying to get the Jehovah's Witness to think for themselves. Trying to get them to actually have their own thought, not just spit out what the watchtower tells them, but to actually think for themselves. And so what? You need to make sure you take your time. And allow for your questions to sink in as you ask them. Give them a chance to contemplate things. And to think of their responses. Alright. Don't just bombard them with a thousand questions all at once and expect it to go okay. You'll freak anybody out doing that. No matter what the topic is. You don't just sit there and again rattle off 20 questions. Alright now answer all of these. What was the first question? So, again, give them time to think about stuff, all right? That's what our goal is. Give them a chance to think about some things. If we can get them to think about things, then that door gets open and we can start doing what we are called to do. So the key thing when witnessing to a Jehovah's Witness is to challenge the authority of the Jehovah's Witness literature. So you're challenging the authority of their literature. That is the number one thing that you want to do. Again, when you first encounter them, again, stay away from the Bible. Stay away from Scripture. Stay away from your interpretations of Scripture and stuff. Attack their literature. Why? Because until you break down that brick wall, you're going to keep running into it every single time. You got to tear down a wall before you can start rebuilding. So the Jehovah's Witness holds the literature of the Watchtower Society as their primary authority. Again, that literature is their ultimate authority. That is their final authority over everything. And they think that it is the Bible. As you saw last night when we looked at, again, their literature, their holy books and stuff, right? They're basically claiming you can't understand God's word by yourself. You need, this, you need the organization to do it for you. And, the, uh, and all the literature has the Bible in it. So it is scripture. Again, see how they manipulate that to where the publication is now the holy word and not the Bible itself? So to them, their publications are God's word. And it's a sad idea to think about. Their confidence in their literature is their vulnerability. The confidence in the publications that they have is the vulnerability that we can go after. Well, is that the same thing? Cults, cults go after vulnerabilities as well. Yeah, we're not going after somebody's heartbreak, mental problems, or this or that, we are going through a belief system that is inherently wrong and going to send somebody to hell. So the vulnerability of their publications is uh, different than what some of the cults end up doing in attacking somebody's psyche, mental health, emotional state, all those other things. See, we're going to use logic and reason to help them. Logic and reason. 
Again, what are we trying to do? We're trying to get them to think, right? We're trying to get them to think a little bit. That is the key. So here's some starter questions for you to ask them so that you can kind of get the ball rolling as you encounter a Jehovah's Witness. So you can ask them, is there harm in reading the Bible without the aid of the watchtower? Is it harmful to read the Bible without having the Watchtower magazine right there beside you? Of course, they're probably going to tell you the answer is yes. And again, I can pretty much guarantee that's what the answer is going to be. Why? Because they're taught that it is harmful for them to read it without the Watchtower. So again, if they answer yes, then you just continue on with the next question. So is it because one has to read the Watchtower to interpret the Bible or become a Jehovah's Witness? So do you have to actually read the Watchtower to understand the Bible or to become a Jehovah's Witness? Is that why you have to have the Watchtower to help you read the Bible? Or you could ask, is the Bible that deceptive without interpretations for, of the Watchtower? Is the Bible very, that deceptive? Is God, you know, that maniacal to sit there and have something that will be confusing that you need this aid? And I do have these questions again printed out in those handouts I gave you all for today and stuff. But here's the thing. Even though you have these questions, I encourage you to actually write them out in your own words. Don't be like set in stone that this has to be. You want it to be personable. All right. So, again, all these different questions, take time, look over them, and how would you word it? How would you actually say these things? And write them out in your own words. And you'll also need to make sure that you kind of study them a little bit. That way you know them. Now, is it okay to have a cheat sheet with you whenever you're going to witness to somebody or whatnot every now and then? Yes, it is. But at the same time, again, you want this to fit, you want it to be authentic. You want it to be authentic. And so again, you don't want it to be just some kind of cardboard cut, you know, whatever. So again, I do encourage again to write these questions down in your own words and again rehearse them a little bit and stuff so that you can, you know, show them that you actually do care. And again, it feels like it's coming from you and not somebody else. Okay. So another question you may be able to ask is, where would you get your beliefs from if you didn't have the Watchtower? Where would you get your beliefs from if you did not have the Watchtower magazine? And note that the italicized up there, right? that's talking about the magazine. So again, if you didn't have the Watchtower magazine, where would all your beliefs come from? Now, when, if you ask this question, there will probably be a number of responses that will be prepared for just about anything. Because <laughs> you can't guarantee how people are going to respond to questions, right? Most of the time. So again, you've got to be prepared for a, di a bunch of different responses. But remember, your key goal is to stick to the basics. Stick to your questions. Don't get sidetracked. Because they may try to throw you a curveball and try to redirect the conversation where they can start controlling it again. In fact, I can guarantee you, if, they're, if you're dealing with the two that are coming to your doorstep, that's exactly what they're going to try to do. They're going to try to throw those curveballs where they can start dictating the tone of the conversation once more. Why? Because that's what they're trained to do. You can't let them have the ball in their court. You cannot let them dictate the conversation. You have to dictate the conversation. But again, be nice about it, right? <laughs> Don't be hostile. Don't be mean about it. But again, so stick to the basics and your questions. Again, don't get sidetracked on stuff. Just like, oh, we'll talk about it later. Let's, I want you to answer me this. Answer this question. Another question would be, which has more purpose and value to you? The Bible or the Watchtower? What has more purpose and value to you as an individual? God's Word or the Watchtower Magazine? Which one? 
And this is a question that needs to be repeated. I mean, not right, you know, not back to back to back, but as it needs to be kind of sprinkled through a little bit as you are having these conversations. As you continue to build and dive deeper and continue to get them to think about things, which one has more value? Which one has more authority? The Bible or the watchtower? Because by doing that, it keeps those wheels turning and keeps them thinking about things. This final question is very, very important. As I said, this is probably one of the most important questions you can ask because it forces Jehovah's Witness to really consider if they truly follow the Bible or if they are just following this Watchtower publication. Are you really following what the Bible says or are you following the Watchtower magazine? That is something they have to consider. All these questions, again, are important because none of the answers can be found in their literature. The answers to any of these questions cannot be found in anything that they have out there and published. That's why these are important. So you're circumnavigating all of their indoctrination and getting them to consider things from a different point of view. And that's what we got to do. You can't go after the indoctrination. You've got to go around it and find them. Not the organization. You're finding that person. You're finding that individual so that you can open that individual back up again. Because remember, the individual is closed out in a cult, right? Joe's witnesses are the same, right? No individual thinking. You don't think for yourself. You do what we say. Follow what we do. And so what? The individual is shut down. We've got to find the individual. All right. So they have literally nothing to appeal to as you ask these questions. They have nothing within their literature that they can go out and pull out and sit there and try to answer you with. And so you're going to definitely catch them off guard. <laughs> because they're used to people arguing scripture with them or this or that with them that they automatically know the answer to. So by a asking these type of questions, you're catching them off guard and you're putting down their defenses a little bit more so and breaking through it a little bit. So another question. Well, not another question, but we tend to think, right, we talked about last night, the holy books, they claim that the Bible is their sole authority, right? So are their beliefs based solely on the Bible? Are their beliefs based solely on the Bible? If the Jehovah's Witness claim this, if they claim that yes, it is the Bible that is their authority, if you ask them about that question again, the Bible or the Watchtower magazine, which one's more important? They say, well, the Bible is, that's where our sole authority is. Continue on with this. Because, again, they have to realize it's not the Bible that their authority is, it's that magazine and the publications. So again, if, so if they try to claim this, then you ask the Jehovah's Witness, then, or sir, why do you need to study, study aids like the Watchtower? Why do you need to have a study aid to the Bible like the Watchtower if the Bible is your sole authority and your beliefs are based only on the Bible? Why do you have to have this study aid to help you interpret it? And they, again... Answers will probably vary, right? Again, you cannot sit there and just predict what other people are going to say. But no matter what they say, just kind of, again, stick to your guns, stick to what you're doing, right, and the questions you're going to ask. You know, you can continue by asking, what would your life be like without the Watchtower, Watchtower Society? What would your life be like if you did not have the Watchtower Society in it? Why? Why would it be that way? Then you can ask them, what would your life be like without Jesus? Hmm. There you go. So what would, the watch, what would your life be like without the Watchtower Society? Why would that be so? And then, okay, so what, what would your life be like without Jesus? Again, getting them to think a little bit, right? they got to ponder some things, get the wheels going. 
which loss would be greater? Which loss would be greater for you? Losing, your, losing the Wash Tire Society or losing Jesus? Why? Why would what you said be the greatest loss? Like I said again, you've got to get them to think. You're, again, you're breaking down those defenses. You're circumnavigating around things. And you're trying to, again, find the individual. So you could also ask, do you find your spiritual convictions and life's purpose from Jesus or the Watchtower Society? So where are you getting your spiritual convictions from or your life's purpose? Does it come from the Lord Jesus Christ or is it coming from the Watchtower Society? And again, why? Don't just accept your response. You need an explanation. All right. You always want an explanation. Why? Because as they are trying to explain it, again, they are having to think about it. All right. They are having to think about it. You can also end up using this one. According to John 14, 6, Jesus stated that he is the way, the truth, and the life. All right. So what qualifications does the Watchtower Society have that equals Jesus' claims? I thought you said don't argue scripture with them. We're not. Let the Bible speak for itself. You're not putting your interpretation on Do not put your interpretation on Don't try to explain what that means. Let them think on it for themselves. All right? Again, don't try to explain anything about that verse. Just say, hey, this is what that verse says. So can, how can the, what qualifications does the watchtower have that equals this claim that Jesus has? How can the watchtower claim to be equal to Jesus? If Jesus says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. I say you're not arguing theology. You're not arguing scripture. And also, again, make sure you're not bombarding the witness with all these questions at one time. Right? Again, leave some space for them to think. Give them time to respond. Again, you don't want to overwhelm the person. Again, anybody can be overwhelmed by any series of questions. Again, it doesn't matter what it is. But in something this delicate, you definitely want to make sure you take your time. Again, give them time to process, time to think. That's important. So if you start feeling in your spirit that you're not content with any of the answers that you've been given, then here's some more questions that you can ask kind of to continue the conversation on a little bit and again there you don't have to do all of it you don't have to ask all these questions don't feel like you have to do every bit of this pick out three or four things that you feel are good that you think okay I, this will work for me and ask those questions Again, you do not feel like you have to do all of this. All right? I'm giving you many different avenues, many different questions and stuff to ask so that you have kind of a choice in the matter of how you present what you're doing. All right. So again, don't feel like you have to do all of it. Okay? You do not have to ask all these questions. But again, I would pick out you know a handful, right? a small handful of them and go with that. So if you don't... If you're not content with the answers from before, here's a few more. Oh, sorry, I didn't skip down in my notes. <laughs> my bad. It's all right. We'll just keep. We'll go with it. But uh, so again, if you're not content with some of those, again, here's some others. So would you have an answer to my questions if you did not have the Watchtower? If I started asking you questions about various Bible doctrines, would you have an answer for it without the Watchtower magazine? Are your answers based upon the Bible by itself or what you read in the Watchtower? And that's a big one. So are your answers coming straight from the Bible by itself or are they coming out of that magazine that you have? How did you arrive at what you believe is true? Did you arrive at that on your own or through the Watchtower magazine? Did you think of this for yourself or were you told this from this magazine? 
But again, trying to get the person to think a little bit. And I do apologize for skipping a few things. I didn't mean to. So, once you start asking some of these questions, then you can start digging in and start, again, you're already starting to kind of break down that wall, break down their trust in that a little bit. But now we're going to start getting some of the heavy hitters. So the very next thing you need to do is start to try to challenge the inspiration of the Watchtower. You need to challenge the inspiration of the Watchtower magazine. Now here's the thing. The Jehovah's Witness will never bring this up. And they don't expect you to either. They are not going to bring up the inspiration of their publications. And they do not expect you to do it either. So by doing this, again, you're throwing them another curveball, right? That they are not expecting. This is your advantage. Okay? Your advantage is to, again, ask them things that they are not expecting you to ask them. That they do not have an answer to from their publications. Again, they have to think on their own. All right? That is the key. So one of the key things is that the Watchtower itself is not inspired and neither are the writers of the Watchtower and they, you actually get that from their own literature. And again, you have the quotes in those little pamphlets. If you need uh, somebody to blow them up, I think uh, Pastor Sean would be happy to retype them out and kind of grow, make them bigger for you or whatnot. No, he's shaking his head no. You get, get a magnifying glass in, I guess. But So, but... Take some of these quotes with you and some of these things because it will help you out a little bit. And again, because you can show them where this comes from. So the Watchtower Society has also said that the fact that some have Jehovah's Spirit does not mean those now serving as Jehovah's Witnesses are inspired. That does not mean that they're inspired. It does not mean that the writings in this magazine, the Watchtower, are inspired and infallible and without mistakes. There you go. And that comes from their Awake magazine. Uh huh. Another quote The brothers preparing these publications are not infallible. Their writings are not inspired as those of Paul and of other Bible writers. Coming from the same magazine, same page. However, the Watchtower does not claim to be inspired in its utterances, nor is it dogmatic. And that comes from the Watchtower magazine, and notice that's page 263 of that magazine. I told you it's a, sometimes they get thick sometimes on those magazines. And so they're not inspired, nor are they dogmatic. Really? Not dogmatic. All right. So the next quote we have, so the slave is not divinely inspired, but continues to search the scriptures and carefully scrutinize world events as well as the situation of God's people, so as to understand the ongoing fulfillment of Bible prophecy, because of human, or sorry, because of human limitations, at times there may be an incomplete or incorrect understanding of some matter that may require correction later. Well, that's been the story of their whole existence, correcting things as they go. Again, this issue must be brought up. It has to be brought up. You've got to bring up this issue of inspiration from their materials. Again, you can show them the quotes that you have here. Again, print it out big enough where you, know, you can sit there and show them and have them read it coming straight from their publications. And have them read it. You don't read it to them, have them read it. That way they can see it for themselves. Because if you read something yourself, you are processing it more of somebody, than somebody who's reading it to you half the time. So print, the, so print some of these things out, show it to them. Hey, especially if you know you're going to be dealing with a Jehovah's Witness uh, specifically. Show it to them. And then once you show them that the Watchtower publications are not inspired, and they even claim that, remind them 
that God's word is inspired. God's word is inspired. 2 Timothy 3.16 All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. I can't ever say that verse without telling you this. Doctrine is what's right. Reproof is what's not right. Correction is how to get right. Instruction of righteousness is how to stay right. So, again, I can't read that without saying that. I've heard that too many times. But what? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. The Bible is inspired. The watchtower is not. So once you confront them with this, then ask these three questions. This issue will end up raising three questions you definitely need to ask. Since the Bible is the inspired Word of God... What is its purpose and eternal value to the witnesses? So since the Bible is the inspired word of God, what is the purpose and eternal value for a Jehovah's Witness? They're going to have to think about that for a little bit. Because again, these answers are not anywhere in their stuff. If the watchtower is not inspired like the Bible, what is, what is its purpose and eternal value? What's the purpose and eternal value of the watchtower if it's not inspired as Scripture is? How can it have a purpose and eternal value if it's not inspired by God? If the watchtower is not inspired by Jehovah... To what will the witnesses appeal as his authority? So again, if the watchtower is not inspired by Jehovah, then what will you as a Jehovah's Witness appeal to as your authority? It's a question. Good question. Because why? If you're just claiming to be the spokesperson for God, but you're not being inspired by God, there's a contradiction in that logic. You also can bring up some of the false prophecies that the Watchtower has created. Again, as has put forth. So there are many false prophecies. Again, we looked at some of those through the history a little bit, some of the things that they claim. But here's just a good quote. You don't even have to even go through that list of the stuff that, you know, they prophesied that didn't come true. And here's a good quote right here from their own stuff. The Wake Magazine. Jehovah's Witnesses, in their eagerness for Jesus' second coming, have suggested dates that turned out to be incorrect. Never in these instances, however, did they presume to originate predictions in the name of Jehovah. Never did they say, these are the words of Jehovah. So what? They are simply men making guesses. They're not inspired by Jehovah. And you're trusting them for the truth? None of the predictions the society admits making were inspired by Jehovah. Again, none of these predictions, again, that quote right there basically again tells us that none of the predictions that they make are actually inspired by Jehovah God. So since that is the case, then how can they claim to be the spokesperson for Jehovah if he did not give them or inspire their claims? We just said a while ago. How can you be a spokesperson for God if God is not inspiring you or giving you the information that you are using? Kind of contradictory, right? All right, so, but here's the question. What if the Watchtower all of a sudden decides, all right, we're going to be inspired? Well, if they start claiming inspiration, they can't. The Watchtower will never be able to claim inspiration. Why? Because everything written in the Watchtower from the first magazine to the present day would all have to be reworked. And would no longer be valid theology 
Because all that was uninspired. And inspiration starts now. So everything that their entire belief system was based on would have to be literally picked up and thrown out the window. And they'd have to start over. And they're not going to do that. Because then they would lose everything. They would lose all their followers guaranteed for that. Look at me. I still got a little ways to go. So again, so they'll have to end up throwing all that out. So let's real quickly look at some inconsistencies of Jesus' death and resurrection. Some of the inconsistencies that they teach about Jesus' death and resurrection. We looked at, again, what they believe last night about these two things. So let's look at the death first. According to the Watchtower Society, Jesus died on a torture stake with a single nail holding his hands. Right? So instead of on a cross like this, right, up here like this right here, should be a picture up there. Yep, there it is. All right. So while artist renderings will show Jesus on a torture stake, on the same page that the article, and not necessarily this picture, but on the same page as the quote I'm fixing to give you, they have a picture of Jesus on a torture stake. They end up making this following statement. In one instance, he invited Thomas to inspect the wounds inflicted by, in his hands by means of the nails. Plural. And they're quoting John 20, 19 through 29 there. Again, summarizing that. That comes from the Watchtower magazine. And right beside this statement, they have a picture of Jesus on a torture stake with how many nails going through his hands? One. But here it says nails, plural. And you can even take them to the scripture. You can open up the New World Translation, their version of the Bible, and it will still say nails, plural. So, again, so which one's right? By the time, in 1966, uh, we saw that quote last night, right? So we know for a fact Jesus died on a torture stake, right? In 1966, they made that claim that, yes, we know this is a fact. But I think in the 1980s, they're not as confident about it. <laughs> uh, we cannot know precisely where the nails pierced him. And notice it said nails. Though it was obviously in the area of his hands, the scriptural account simply does not provide exact details, nor does it need to. We thus recognize that depictions of Jesus' death in our publications, such as you see on page 24, are merely reasonable artistic renderings of the scene, not statements of an anatomical absolutes. Even before they did that, because that was 1987, 1984, they say that any drawings of Jesus on the stake should, yeah, stake should be understood as artists' productions, they offer merely a representation based on the limited facts we have. These are just simply artist reproductions. They're not inspired. So you want to take this idea of the torture stake and compare it to the Bible. Compare it to the Bible. So you already have the nail, right? The one nail versus the two nails, right? We already have that. There's something else as well. If you look at these pictures of Jesus, there's a sign over him. Over him. But notice the position of it. It's over what part of the body? His hands. It's over his hands. What does the Bible say? Matthew 27, 37 states that, And they set up over his head... His accusation written, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. So which one is it? Was it over his head or over his hands? Where was that sign placed? Was there one nail or two? So again, questions to ask. According to the biblical account of Jesus' death, note that a sign was placed over, above Jesus' head, not over his hands as seen in the torture stake. Is the Watchtower's depiction of Jesus' death based upon biblical truth? Is this depiction actually based on biblical truth? Did it come from the Bible? And if not, what is it based upon? If it didn't come from the Bible, what's it based upon? 
And also, is this picture of the torture stake, is this based upon eyewitness accounts as recorded in Scripture? Is this eyewitness account as well, like Scripture is? Scripture is eyewitness account. So once you get, if you get past that, and again, you don't have to use all these tactics, right? As we've said before, you don't have to use all these tactics. I do not recommend doing it all at once. Because, again, you're overwhelmed people. But if they want to keep the conversation going, then you can keep it moving along. Sometimes you might use the death. Sometimes you might use the next one, the resurrection. Sometimes you might not even have to use either one of them. Sometimes they might just see the light, I mean, toward like the fourth, fifth question and go, oh, man, I've been duped. 